Good evening. I invite your attention to the 53rd chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. And God willing, tonight we will address the subject mentioned in the first line. The subject of my message is our report. Isaiah writes in verse 1, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of Jehovah been revealed? It's a weighty question and a weighty answer. So let's consider the subject of our report. First of all, what is this report? I can give you a definitive answer from God's word as to what it is. Locate Romans chapter 10. Now, hold your finger in Isaiah chapter 53. Locate Romans chapter 10. And in the 10th chapter of the epistle to Rome, Paul addresses the subject of the gospel which we preach. He addresses the fact that God sent men to preach the gospel and none will be saved apart from hearing and believing the gospel. And in Romans 10 verse 16, Paul says that not all have believed, or pardon me, have, not all have obeyed our gospel. Now consider that phrase. Not all have obeyed the gospel. For, he continues, Isaiah, or Isaiah has written, Lord, who has believed our report? The two phrases in that verse are synonymous. They mean the same thing. To obey the gospel is to believe our report. Therefore, our report is the gospel. The word gospel means glad tidings and good news. And our report is the good news, the glad tidings of salvation in and by and through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah here furthermore calls it our report. Who is included in that little word, our. Who has this report to give? First of all, it would be Isaiah himself. He wrote it. He wrote it. He's the penman. He can say, this is Isaiah's report. I wrote this. But then again, Isaiah would also say, this is the Holy Spirit's report. Because Isaiah wrote as he was moved of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning that God breathed it into the writers of holy scripture. We read that holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So that what you read here is God's word. You can see Isaiah's experience in it. You can see Isaiah's personality. But this is God's word. The Holy Spirit sat there and said, Isaiah, take up your pen and I want you to write these words. And he would breathe God's word into the ear of Isaiah and Isaiah would wrote so that when he concluded, he could look to the Holy Spirit and say, this is our report, yours and mine. You inspired it, I wrote it. But then again, this is also the report of God the Father. Unhappily, our Bibles are not always divided by chapter in the best places. This 53rd chapter of Isaiah's prophecy should also include the last three verses of chapter 52. If you'll go to chapter 52, you'll find Jehovah speaking, and he says, Behold my servant, his servant is Jesus Christ in this instance. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, wisely, circumspectly, 
successfully. That word prudent takes in a lot of different things. If you just look at the way that Jesus Christ dealt when he was on this earth, it's all included in this word prudently, circumspectly, wisely, successfully. My servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high after he has dealt prudently and because he has dealt prudently. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more, more than the sons of men. And this was particularly true in his passion and in his death on Calvary as a consequence of what happened there and what led up to it. Roman soldiers took him and tied him to a post, took a cat of nine tails in which were probably embedded metal strips and they plowed his back asunder 39 stripes. They plucked the beard from his face. They said he's a king, he needs a crown. They planted one of thorns. They crossed it to his brow. They spat upon him. They beat him. They smote him. And that was just the beginning. They marched him to Calvary. There they nailed him to a tree. If you had seen him 24 hours earlier, you would have said this cannot be the same person. His visage, his form, marred more than the sons of men. But so, verse 15, because of this he shall sprinkle many nations. He shall sprinkle them in two ways. First, he will sprinkle them with his atoning blood like that priest did on the day of the atonement. Went into the most holy place, took the blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat and made atonement for Israel. Except that priest had to do it every year. This man, Jesus Christ, took his own blood into that tabernacle not made with hands in the heavens and there in his death on Calvary, he goes into that most holy place and takes his blood and sprinkles it on the mercy seat before God. And God says, it's finished. Therefore, Jesus Christ says, it's finished. Furthermore, we're told by the prophet that he shall sprinkle clean water on people. The water, the regenerating grace of the Holy Spirit. He shall sprinkle many nations, not Jews only, but um, even for people like you and me. I can tell that we evidently come from a lot of different nations. Well, he shall sprinkle many nations. And kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. And this will be particularly true when he comes back in all his glory and the most glorious king of this earth will be like the queen of Sheba when she looked at Solomon and she said I heard he was great but the half has not been told and when he comes back the most glorious king on this earth is going to look up and say I heard he was great but oh I must close my mouth He's greater than ever I could have imagined. That is Jehovah's report. And that is the report of every gospel preacher. What I have just read to you and what I shall read to you is the report of every gospel preacher. And tonight, I'm happy to say this is my report. I have a report to give to you tonight. 
And here it is. Now, I'm rather certain that your pastor jealously guards his pulpit. I do. I do. So therefore, I'm rather confident that uh, when I'm finished tonight, you're going to say, that's Todd's report too. Well, that's true because this is the report of every gospel preacher. This is the report of God the Father. This is the report of God the Holy Spirit. And this is the report of Isaiah. And we say, we agree. Our report. Who has believed? our report. I want you to consider next that very question. How does one believe our report? All right. We looked at it a while ago. To obey the gospel is to believe our report. The gospel. I'm not giving you an offer tonight. I'm, I'm not offering the gospel to you. Gospel preachers do not do that. I'm not giving you an invitation. This is not an invitation to the gospel that I preach. It is not something that we put before you in the hope that, oh, please accept this. Accept Jesus. Please do that. No, no, no. That's not our report. That's somebody else's report. What is our report? Our report is your eternal destiny depends upon whether you believe this. This is a command. This gospel I preach, it's not an offer. It's not an invitation. It is a command. He who believes shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be damned. So that's what it is to believe our report. It is to obey. The gospel. This is a word to be obeyed. Do not consider it nonchalantly. Consider it very seriously because your eternal destiny depends upon how you respond to this command to believe the gospel. Who has believed our report? That's the question. The answer to the question is also a question. The very next question. The question is, who has believed our report? The answer to the question is, to whom has the arm of Jehovah been revealed? If Jehovah has revealed his arm, you have believed our report. And you cannot believe our report unless Jehovah reveals his arm. Now how does Jehovah reveal his arm? What is it for Jehovah to reveal his arm? Well, in the first place, the gospel itself is the arm of Jehovah that must be revealed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. All God has to do is turn the gospel loose. <laughs> I can preach it, but I cannot turn it loose. But oh, if God takes the gospel and says, bear your arm, the gospel is going to have some remarkable results every time it's done. But then again, the arm of Jehovah is the arm of Jehovah, which is omnipotent and all-powerful. And unless God makes bare his arm and unleashes his gospel, none of us are going to believe. So who has believed our report? Everyone to whom Jehovah has made bare his arm. What are the elements of our gospel and our report? First of all, I would have you consider that Christ received divine protection. Look in verse number two. Christ received divine protection. <clears throat> For he shall grow up before him, Jehovah, as a tender plant. Now, what is a tender plant? A tender plant is one that you must be careful, keep away from it, because if you hit it with your foot, you may break it, kill it. You can walk on the grass, it'll just pop right back up. But some plants are so tender that if you hit them wrong, they're broken. 
no good. A tender plant is much like a newborn infant. When, when a horse gives birth to a colt, the colt hits the ground and jumps up, exercises those legs, and soon begins to imitate its mother in grazing. It runs around, you know, little colts, they're almost on their own very shortly. Well, that wasn't true of you when you were born. <laughs> How many months was it before you could stand? How many months was it before you took your first step? For how many years did someone have to feed you thrice a day? How many years was it that somebody had to see that you were provided for? Jesus was the same way. Somebody had to change his swaddling cloths. Someone had to feed him. Someone had to ascertain that his needs were met. He grew up just like any others. But then again, notice that the text says he shall grow up before Jehovah. Jesus had some enemies that you and I do not have. In Revelation chapter 12, we read that there is a woman who is with child, about to be delivered, and right in front of her, the dragon, the devil, is crouched and waiting because as soon as her child is born, he's going to devour the child. Well, that woman is Israel, the mother of Christ. Christ was born of Israel. He's the child that was born of her. And as soon as he was born, the devil tried to snatch him and devour him. Therefore, Jehovah had to protect him. Shortly after Jesus was born, his own king, Herod, king of the Jews, said, I want him dead. How long ago was he born? Ah, within the last couple of years. Where was he born? Bethlehem. I want every male child, two years old and under, killed so that I can get rid of him. I'll not have him. I'll not have him. But he shall grow up, Jehovah said, before me. Therefore, Jehovah said to his legal father, take him to Egypt. He must grow up. If he stays there, he will not take him to Egypt. So he shall grow up before Jehovah. He received divine protection. Furthermore, Christ was so lowly in his beginning that nothing great was expected of him. Nothing great. I mean, even when he turned 30 years of age, nothing great was expected of him. When he began his ministry, why was nothing great expected of him? Well, consider. He shall grow up as a root out of dry ground. What do you expect of a root out of dry ground? Nothing. Nothing's going to come of that. Just go ahead and pull it up and get rid of it. Jesus grew up as a root out of dry ground. He was born in Bethlehem. The scriptures say it is the least of the towns of Judah. He was born to a lowly woman of whom we would have never heard were it not for the knowledge of her son. His mother was married to a lowly carpenter who was financially incapable of providing to him the finer things of life. His mother was so impoverished that she offered the least sacrifice at his presentation to the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, not a lamb of the first year, which she could not afford. Jesus was raised in what was called the Galilee of the Gentiles, the Jewish province scorned by Judeans because of the heathenism prevalent there. He was raised in a town so contemptible that his own countrymen said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He had no earthly real estate, not even a place to lay his head. He dressed in the plain and simple garb of a peasant. And when he died, they divided his entire wardrobe, and there were only five items in it 
an inner tunic, an outer robe, a belt, sandals, and a turban. That's all he had. We don't expect much from this man, do we? In the eyes of the world, we do not expect much of him. He was so lowly, nothing great was expected of him. He was plain and simple in his appearance. Verse 2 again. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus of Nazareth was the exact opposite of religious leaders today who attract men to themselves through their good looks, charismatic personalities, lavish lifestyles and promises that you can be as handsome and as healthy and wealthy as me if you'll help me out here. Now, Jesus did none of that. Did none of that. You're not going to find any kind of a charming personality in trying to beguile people. He's as plain and simple a man, so much so that if you had looked at him, you would never desire him apart from divine grace. Yes, his wife says he's altogether lovely, but she's the object of grace. She knows. She sees a beauty that no one else sees, but physically, nah, he's not going to attract many followers. It'll take divine grace if anybody follows this man. Furthermore, Christ was despicable to men and rejected by them. He is despised and rejected by men, verse 3. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. At the end of his life, Pilate had two men. He says, I have a man called Barabbas. He is a murderer, a seditionist, a rebel, led a rebellion, killed some people, stole some things. Worst kind of criminal there can be. And then there's Jesus. I'm going to turn one of them loose. Turn Barabbas loose. Turn him loose. What shall I do with Jesus? Kill him. Kill him. His own countrymen. One of his own apostles betrayed him. The other 11 ran. And God the Father forsook him. He was despised and rejected. And I'll tell you this, you also will despise and reject him apart from divine grace. Christ was deprived of earthly happiness, verse 3, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We never read of him laughing, never. I say not that he never did. I'm just saying you never read it. Why was he such a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief? How would you live right now if you knew that in a few days your own countrymen would turn you over to your enemies, they would nail you to a tree and God would forsake you and you would be made sin. How would you, would you go through life jolly and cheerful and full of jocularity, would you? No. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But then again, have you ever realized what a sinner you are? Have you? Has it grieved you? Made you full of sorrow? Well, let me tell you, if you know sorrow and grief because of sin, Jesus is for you. <laughs> he knows what it is. He knows grief. He knows sorrow. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And Christ died as a substitute 
for Jehovah's people. Verse 8, latter part. Jehovah says, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Who are Jehovah's people? Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, they are identified as those whom God the Father chose out of our fallen race before the foundation of the world, chose them in Christ in order that they might be holy and blameless, sanctified and justified, and stand before him in love through all eternity. And furthermore, these were predestined to be God's adopted children. And furthermore, they were highly favored before the foundation of the world to be accepted in Christ in whom they have redemption and forgiveness of sins. These are Jehovah's people. He says, they're my chosen predestined ones and he and Christ shall be stricken for them. Who are Jehovah's people? Look in verses 12 and 11. Who are Jehovah's people? In verse number 12, they're identified by number about halfway through verse 12, or toward the end actually. He bore the sin of, what's the next word? He bore the sin of, talk to me. He bore the sin of many. What is many? Less than all, but more than a few. Well, preacher, I, I believe Jesus died for everybody. That's your report. You're welcome to it. This is our report, okay? This is our report. He bore the sin of many. Jehovah took the sin of his chosen people, who are many in number, laid it on Christ, and what did Christ do for the many? Look in verse 11. About halfway through. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify. What's the next word? Talk to me. What's the next word? Many. What many? The many whose sins Jehovah took and laid on him. The many whose sins he bore to Calvary. And he justified every single solitary one of them. And there are many. <laughs> That's my report. And I'm sticking to it. All right, I'm sticking to it. Who are Jehovah's people? He shall be stricken for my people, Jehovah says. Furthermore, you can identify the many of Jehovah's people because in verse number 11, pardon me, in verse number 5, we confess he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes he made healing possible. No, that's somebody else's report. <laughs> that's somebody else's report. Our report is that if he was wounded for you, if he stood before God as your substitute, you have been healed. And you were healed when stripes were laid upon him. By his stripes we are healed. That's my report. Everyone for whom he bore stripes has been healed. For the transgressions of Jehovah's people he was stricken. Furthermore, Christ paid the penalty for the sins of all for whom he died. Now we're going to begin in verse number four. And quickly, we're going to expound the rest of the chapter. Verse four. Surely he has borne our griefs. The word 
means sicknesses. We're just all a bunch of sick sinners. Every time Jesus healed someone of a physical infirmity, that physical infirmity pointed to a spiritual infirmity. Did he, did he heal the blind? Yes. And we all are spiritually. Did he, did he heal the deaf? Yes. And we all are spiritually. Did they bring paralytics to him who could not come? Yes, because that's what we are. We're just a bunch of paralytics. We must be brought, enabled to come. And he came to heal us of all our sicknesses. He bore our griefs and our sicknesses. He, he carried our sorrows. What sorrows? Those of our hearts when we finally realize what sinners we are. Do you recall when God let you see what a sinner you were? Oh, what grief. What grief. My sins did that to him? Yes. What grief. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted because on Calvary he suffered divine wrath. In three hours, from high noon to 3 p.m., he suffered the everlasting hell that every one of God's people deserves. And there, he was, that's for you, okay? That's for you. That's for you. Stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted for three hours. Until finally he could shout, it's finished. It's finished. I've suffered it all. He was punished and bruised and stricken, smitten of God. He was wounded for our transgressions in verse 5. That's our rebellions against God because we're just all a bunch of rebels against God. That's all we are. We are at enmity against God. God says, here's our law. Let me have it. I want to break it. That, you know, that's the way we are. We're just a bunch of rebels. Jesus died for none but rebels. He was bruised for our iniquities. That word iniquities means perversions against the standard, God's standard. Jesus died for none but perverts. Yeah, preacher, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not a pervert. Well, he, he didn't die for you. Jesus died for perverts. People who for pervert the truth. People who pervert God's word. He died for perverts in their perversions. Rebels against God's law. Yeah, but preacher, I'm... I just don't think I'm quite that bad. Well, that's your report, all right? Our report is he died for the worst kinds of people there are. He didn't die for good people. He died for sinners. The chastisement for our peace was upon him because he was punished so that God's enemies could be reconciled to him. And all we like sheep. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah, why did you say sheep? Well, I think that's what God's elect are. <laughs> I think they're called sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and Jehovah has laid on Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, the iniquity for us all because the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Not the devil's goats, his sheep. He was oppressed like a slave under a taskmaster as when his enemies drove him to his crucifixion. He was afflicted, and more accurately, this means he let himself be afflicted. He said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. Yet he opened not his mouth. He opened not his mouth. He did not revile in return. 
they bring him before the Sanhedrin. And they've got all these false witnesses, and they bring them in. And these false witnesses give their reports, and he stands there and never says a word. Never says a word. Until finally they ask the question, Are you the son of the highest? And he said, It is as you said. <laughs> when he finally answered, they said, It's blasphemy. Take him away. They take him to Pilate, and Pilate has him scourged, brings him out, stands him there before the people, and his own countrymen are there before Pilate, and they're hurling accusations, false accusations against him. And Pilate looks at Jesus, and he says, do you not hear what they're saying? Because Jesus was not answering them. Do you not hear? And Jesus answered not a word, and the scriptures say Pilate marveled. Pilate, all he's doing is fulfilling scripture. He opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shivers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken from prison that of the Sanhedrin and that of Pilate. He was taken from judgment, particularly Pilate's judgment hall. And who would declare his generation? His generation are his children. And he has them. Oh, he has them. Who would declare them? They're not physical. They're the children of God. Somebody's going to declare them. He was cut off from the land of the living. He never married a physical wife and never had physical children, but he has a wife and many children. <laughs> Who will declare it? Verse 9. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, probably meaning that he was crucified between sinners and buried in a rich man's tomb because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. Jehovah has put him to grief. Why would Jehovah put him to grief? That's the only way Jehovah's people can be saved. That's my report. That's my report. Furthermore, I want you to see that Christ succeeded in his mission to save all for whom he died. Verse 5, look at it. And by his stripes we are healed of our deafness, of our muteness, of our blindness, of our paralysis, of our leprosy, of our uncleanness, whatever spiritual disease we have in his death, by his death, through his death, we are healed. He did not make a prognosis. He did not write a prescription. He did not attempt to heal. He healed. Period. That's our report. He healed. Verse 10. When you, Jehovah, make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's going to die and then see his children? Yep, that's what it says. <laughs> How's a dead man going to see his children? Now, he's going to be raised from the dead. You see here, right here in this gospel, our report, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he shall see his seed, Jehovah shall prolong his days, because he's going to live through eternity. And the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Meaning that he's going to say, it was worth it. And I succeeded. I came to fulfill the law. It is finished. 
Jehovah said, you shall save your people from your sins. It is finished. Jehovah said, you shall be the end of the law for righteousness. It is finished. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He will have no stillborn children. Everyone for whom he died shall be healed and justified. And that's our report. Furthermore, he was exalted by his father because of his success in saving his people. Verse 12, Jehovah says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul on the death and was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for them so that my servant has dealt prudently, successfully, circumspectly, and wisely. And that's our report. Our report is that Jesus Christ is Jehovah's suffering servant. That Jehovah has taken the sins of his people and laid them on Christ. That Christ has borne those sins to Calvary. And on Calvary he was stricken and smitten of God and afflicted because he died there vicariously as a substitute in the place instead of Jehovah's people. And according to our report, every soul for whom he died is justified and healed, saved, sanctified, Reconciled to God. That's our report. Preacher, don't you believe Jesus died for everybody? That's somebody else's report. They're welcome to it. Okay, they're welcome. That's not our report. God did not give that report. Somebody else did. Uh, preacher, I've been told that Jesus made salvation possible, but God gave me a free will so that I could do something about it. That's somebody else's report. Okay, that's not ours. That's not ours. Our report is, your will has nothing to do with it. I think we read something about that a little earlier tonight from John chapter 1. Not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man. It's God's will. It's God's will. That's our report. So, I have one more question. Who has believed our report? Have, ha, have you believed our report? This gospel. Have you obeyed the gospel? I ask myself that question. If there is ever a report worthy of believing, <laughs> it's this one. It's this one. Who has believed our report? You can hear them singing. Man of sorrows. What a name. For the son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a savior. Have you believed our report? 